Father, we just thank you that we get to continue in worship today. Thank you that worship is not, uh, uh, is not just hype, but it's an offering to you. Our worship is, is an offering to you. It's, it's, it's our sacrifice to you. And so we give you our mind, our bodies, our souls, our heart, our spirit. We continue to worship with our, with our finances uh, and with, with truth that transforms us. We ask you today, Holy Spirit, would you come as we look at truth, as we look at your word. I thank you that it's not information, but the gospel is the power of God to transform somebody. And so we just thank you that today the gospel is the power of God and it's gonna shift us from, from lackadaisical and comfortable into radical. In Jesus' mighty name, we thank you that truth transforms. Amen? Everybody say truth transforms. One of my favorite passages is John eight thirty two. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. We love the presence of God in our church. We love to go wild for Jesus. We love to host him. It's one of our top core values, uh, top seven core values. One of our core values is family. We wanna create an environment of family. And one of our core values as well is the word of God. And so we love the teaching and preaching of the word of God. Jesus has uh, used that as, a, as his strategy to transform people's minds and hearts and lives. And so there is just an anointing that's gonna flow to you from the Lord as we get into the word of God. So I just want you to position yourself like a big old funnel and just receive from the life-giving power of the word of God. So our conversation today, and uh, it's, this is a broad topic. I've spent the last several months diving deep into it. Uh, I did a message um, in California about this. And I just really felt like the Lord wanted me to, to, to minister here as well. And so I've expanded on it a bit, but I'm gonna introduce a topic and idea that uh, might be like no news to you, or it might actually uh, challenge you and what you have been raised to believe or think or thought was biblical. I wanna present to you what I believe is the biblical view about the Lordship of Jesus. I wanna talk about the Lordship of Jesus. Somebody say Lordship of Jesus. Because it's time for us to just, to, to go from just believing in Jesus to making Jesus our Lord, amen? You know that there's something called believing in Jesus and believing in Jesus gives you eternal life. But when Jesus is Lord, it's more than just believing. When Jesus is Lord, it's actually surrender, it's yielding, it's obeying. It's no longer we who live, but Christ lives in us. So through believing, there's certain things that are accessible to us. But beyond that, the Lord has given us all through our scripture an invitation to go beyond believing. Somebody say beyond believing. Beyond. There's something beyond believing and it's called lordship. Sometimes in theology, people have put together this whole idea that believing and lordship are the same thing, but it's not true. It's not true. And, and scripture, you can do a study on this. And so uh, what I've done is I've done a thorough study. I'm gonna introduce some of it today, but this, you can download uh, some of my study on this. And I encourage you to go deeper, but if you wanna download the notes, you can go on our website and go to messages or I don't know where it is. Leanna, where, where, where is it? Is there a QR code? It's in messages. Okay, it's right there. So keep that up for a minute or two. But you can download three documents. Okay, one of them is a study that I'm not gonna cover today. It's just called The Kingdom of God, Heaven, Eternal Life, and all the differences between that. It's about a 13-page study. It just gives you a bunch of verses. And, and some of this stuff I'm gonna a little bit touch on today. But if you have questions, this is a good step. Then I'm also gonna give you my full notes from today's message called The Lordship of Jesus. So if you even wanna follow along, like I'll maybe give three verses today, but in those notes, I give like 10 plus verses from each point. Because I want you to know that I don't want to teach anything except for what the word of God says. Because we believe the word of God above theology, above practice, above people, above, above ideas, above sermons, above anything. We just value the word of God, amen? It's one of the values of this house. And so I believe that when we know the truth, it'll set us free. And then there's another one with all of the slides. So if you're like going through the slides, and you're like, man, I, I wanna catch a screenshot of that. No worries, you can just download every single one of the slides and just have them. So for fun, for you. Um, and if you wanna preach this or teach this, go for it, use it. You know, this isn't me. I'm just literally putting a few scriptures together and, and then just saying what the Bible said in an organized way, that's it. So uh, we're gonna do, uh, you know, being a teacher and a lover of truth, because it's set me free, it's changed my life. I just want to renew our minds with some truth because I believe it's significant. Today, particularly, this is not just a Bible study, but there is a why behind it. I believe that many people are stuck in comfortable Christianity because they believe incorrectly about the importance of lordship versus just salvation. 
because they kind of have put together the idea of being a disciple of Jesus, being in the kingdom of God, and being saved, they've put them into the same thing. And actually, the scripture is very, very clear. Those are two distinct things. You can be saved and have eternal life. And then beyond that, you can enter into the kingdom of God, which means he's your Lord and you're a disciple of his. And there are, there are significant differences both now in this age, which is the kingdom of God is advancing in this age. The kingdom of God is here and now and it's advancing. Then there's gonna be another age to come. That's called the millennial age or the kingdom age where the kingdom of God is fully manifested. That's not for everybody and that's not just for a freer believer. That's only for those that have entered into the kingdom of God. We'll talk about that. And then following that age, after the, you know, the return of Jesus is gonna initiate in the, the full manifestation of the kingdom of God. And then after that, there's gonna be another age called eternity or the eternal age. And there's even a difference in the eternal age between a, just a believer and someone that has made Jesus their Lord and has entered into the kingdom of God. So there are consequences today in the next stage and in the age to come about whether Jesus is just your savior or whether he's your Lord. So that's what I'm proposing today. It, um, in, in many circles that don't understand the kingdom of God and, and what Jesus taught about the kingdom of God, this would be controversial, they would disagree. I would say that the majority of uh, believers in the world would probably, this would kind of shock them, ruffle their feathers, and they probably would naturally not agree until they did a study on it. But Jesus came to preach the kingdom of God, not just salvation. And so the whole message and ministry of Jesus was about entering into the kingdom, not just about salvation. So I want to paint this distinction between these two because the, here's why. It's not just a theological nitty gritty thing that's like, doesn't really matter. It makes a significant difference in how you live and how you live your life today. So this is motivation for us unto, unto this age, the next age, and the age to come. So the question here is, is Jesus your Lord or is he only your savior, okay? Let's start with this verse, Luke six forty six. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you do not do what I tell you to do? So there are those that call Jesus Lord, means that they've believed in him. No one is calling Jesus Lord that hasn't believed in him. Now, there will come a day when the lordship of Jesus will be so revealed on the earth, he'll be so big that every knee will bow and say he's Lord just because of the, the majesty of his revelation. That, there's, a, there's a coming reality of that. Believers and non-believers will be like, whether I wanna be close to you or not, you're definitely Lord, you know? So th there, there is a future reality like that. But today, there are people that call Jesus Lord, but they're not doing anything that the Lord has told them to do. And so Jesus paints a distinction between them. He doesn't say you're not saved. He doesn't say you're gonna go into eternal destruction. He says, I'm inviting you into lordship. Okay, so why do you call me Lord, Lord, not do what I tell you to do? So th th there's a key verse there. So let's start with this. So first I'm gonna talk about being a disciple and then I'm gonna talk about being in the kingdom of God. And I'm gonna make these two things synonymous. But there's some requirements that talk about being a disciple and some requirements about talking about entering the kingdom of God. And then there's also a requirement to be a believer, and we'll talk about that for a moment. But let's start with kind of being a disciple. Since we've been in a discipleship series, I think we did five plus messages on it. We've talked about it in our life groups, but discipleship. So a believer and a disciple is not the same thing, according to scripture. A believer and a disciple is not the same thing. A believer, according to scripture, we'll look at it, is justified and is saved, is justified, and has eternal life. That's what a believer is. So if you look at scripture, all the instances, over 150 of them, a believer is saved, justified, and has eternal life by faith. That's a believer. Believe means faith. Believe in faith. One's a noun, one's a verb. That's the difference between the word believe and the word faith. That's it. <laughs> but essentially, this, it's the exact same principle there. And a disciple is not that. And we talked about this earlier, but a disciple is a follower, a learner, and an imitator of Jesus. The invitation Jesus gave believers is to become disciples. He, he has an invitation to the lost, become a believer and become a disciple. He has an invitation to believers, become a follower, become a disciple. So there's a dual invitation to a non-believer. There's an invitation to a believer. It's to become a disciple. Not every believer is a disciple. Okay, fantastic. Okay, look at John 8, 31. Look at this verse. Here's kind of a key verse that helps you understand the difference here. It, to the Jews who had believed in him. So there were Jews, they believed in Jesus. So were they believers? 
Yes, according to the scripture, there were Jews who believed. Jesus said to them, if you who believed hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples. So he's saying, listen, believing is great, but I'm inviting you to something deeper. Now notice, believing in Jesus is the finished work of Jesus. Jesus offers it as a gift. So if you believe, he gives you a gift called eternal life. That's a gift to anyone who believes. But now look, there's an if you. Wow. So to become a disciple, it's now about your work. To become a believer, it's about Jesus' work. To become a disciple, it's about your work. There's a difference there. We're not preaching that, that, that salvation is by works, but let me tell you what, discipleship is a cost to you and it's about your activity and your work. If you hold to my teaching, now you're really my disciples. So if you don't hold to the teachings of Jesus, you can be a believer, but there's some grave consequences to just being a believer. You miss out on a lot here and you'll definitely miss out on the millennial reign. You're not gonna be part of first resurrection when Jesus returns. And in eternity, you're not gonna be in the new Jerusalem with the, in the city of God with him because that's for just for his bride and his wife. Because there's friends that come and go and then there's those that actually live with him. There's a huge difference between just being a believer and being a disciple of Jesus. So we'll talk about this. And uh, again, I know this might ruffle you up a bit, but that's why I want you to do a study on this. Because <laughs> Jesus came to preach the Lordship, not just faith. Because faith was available in the Old Testament. Now, every, all, all of salvation is by the person of Jesus. In the Old Testament, they looked forward to Jesus. All the sacrifices, the blood offerings, everything was looking forward to Jesus. And if they had faith, they were saved. They were made righteous. Abraham believed looking forward and, it, and he was made righteous. In scripture, righteousness is the exact same thing as salvation. So in the Old Testament, salvation was available looking forward to Jesus. In the New Testament, we look back to what Jesus did. So salvation is always by the work of Jesus, whether it was in the Old Covenant or the New Covenant. It's just whether you're looking forward or backward to the event. But it's always by faith. But a disciple is not by faith. Nowhere do you see the idea of discipleship or entering the kingdom of God and faith associated to it. Faith is not associated to being a disciple and, and entering the kingdom of God. Faith is associated to being a believer. So there's a big difference here, okay? Are you following me? So we're gonna, we're gonna karate ninja chop some stuff and then we're gonna go into some scripture, praise God. So let's take a look at what the Bible says is the requirement to be saved. Now, I think you guys can tell me already, what's the biblical requirement to be saved? Faith. Are there any other requirements to be saved? No, salvation's by faith alone. Now, some people teach that there's more and uh, they're just wrong. I mean, it's okay to be wrong, but uh, it's just, it's better to know that you're wrong, you know? Because salvation's by faith alone. And this is what scripture says. There's, there's 150 verses and you can check a bunch of them out in the study, but salvation's by faith alone. Let's take a look at Acts 16.30. After he brought them out, he said, sirs, what must we do to be saved? So they hear the message, they're preaching the message and they're cut to the heart and they're like, how do we get saved? And Peter preaches them, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. So your faith establishes your salvation. So a, a synonym for salvation in the Bible is justification or righteousness or eternal life is the gift you get. Okay, so these are synonyms for salvation. So we know salvation is by faith alone. Now, some people, they have a hard time with this, but the majority of the Christian world has accepted this and believes that salvation is by faith alone, no works required. We'll talk about James 2 in a moment here, but salvation is by faith alone. So biblically, the only condition for salvation is faith. 115 times in the New Testament, it says that when a person believes, they're saved, aka have eternal life, aka justified. Those are the three words that are used 115 times with faith. 35 times in the New Testament, instead of the word believe, it's the word faith is used. That's, that's the noun form. And that's, what, uh, and that's how a person is justified or they get righteousness by faith. Righteousness by faith. Justification by faith. Eternal life by believing. <laughs> Saved by believing, right? So 150 times, at least in the Bible, we have faith and salvation directly associated. And, and, and nothing else when it comes to salvation. So John 3, 16, let's just take a look at a sample out of, the, out of these 150. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that everyone who believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. So believing, eternal life. That's a free gift of God. 
Anyone who believes God does the work and he gives them a gift. No work required. Actually, John 6, uh, 29, along these lines, when Jesus is preaching to them, he says, when he's talking about eternal life, because they're wondering about eternal life, he says, this is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> That's the only work, the only work unto salvation, because he was talking about eternal life there. But then there's works that are associated not with salvation, they're actually the invitation into being his bride and not just his friend, okay? So we, we saw John three sixteen. let's take John six forty seven. Truly I say to you, the one who believes has eternal life. What's the only way to get eternal life? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, they look forward. In the New Testament, we look backward to the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Amen? Romans 10, 9, let's look at one more just so that we can get a variety. We looked at Jesus' words in John. Let's look at Paul's words in Romans. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So do a study on this, 150 verses about believing and salvation interconnected. No other thing is required for salvation but faith. Believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord, amen? So salvation is by faith, not by works. Now, let's take a look at just a couple of verses that talk about this idea of where it emphasizes faith and then it says not works because that's important because then what we do is we're like, well, yeah, it says faith, but then look at the other passages that say works. No, 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 salvation clearly by faith, not works. We'll talk about the place for works, but it's not when it comes to salvation. There's a place for works and they're very important, but now we're dealing with being a disciple and entering the kingdom, but salvation is by faith, not by works. Take a look at Ephesians 2, 8, 9. It's by grace. You've been saved. Nowhere will you see in scripture that it's by grace you become a disciple or by grace that you enter the kingdom. But it's by grace that you've been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. Everybody say, not by works. <laughs> not by works. So if your salvation anywhere in your theology is associated to what you do, you're wrong based on what the Bible says. I love you, but the truth will set you free. <laughs> So I'm gonna to speak to the truth to you, amen? I'm gonna speak the truth and the truth will set you free. If anywhere you think that your works have to do with your salvation, repent for the kingdom of God because repentance is important for the kingdom of God. Repentance is very important for the kingdom of God because repentance is a change of mind, a change of direction. It involves your works, very, very important. Okay, salvation by faith, not by works. Titus 3, 5, let's take a variety of scriptures. He saved us, not on the basis of deeds, which we've done in righteousness, but according to his mercy. So it's by mercy that we're saved. Because of his mercy, he saved us. It's not because of his mercy that we're disciples or enter into the kingdom of God. He washed us by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. That's a work of God. So there's a work of God and then there's a work of you. And that's what I'm, that's the invitation God invites us into. Jesus said, my father is always working and I join him in his work. Jesus invites us into partnering with him on the earth to expanding the kingdom of God. Sometimes what we've done is we've done a huge disservice to the world. We basically preach an old covenant message, which is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. And that's what we think the gospel is. That's the gospel of salvation. That, I mean, let me just shock you a little bit. That was available in the Old Testament as they look forward to Jesus through the sacrifices and everything else. We're not preaching what was preached in the Old Testament. Jesus came preaching one thing. He preached the gospel of the kingdom. Because that was the upgrade, because the gospel of the kingdom inv invited people into the chambers with the king, into the age of the kingdom, into you know, the chambers of him, into the honeymoon with him for a thousand years, and into the new Jerusalem. That was what Jesus' invitation was. Jesus didn't preach. No, of course Jesus came to seek and save the lost. That's one of the reasons why he came. But his message to them was about the kingdom. Abraham was saved by faith, but the message was about entering the kingdom. Like look, look throughout all of the four gospels, look throughout even what the message the disciples preach. Look at the very last verse of Acts. Acts 16, verse 34, 32, I forget. Just the very last one. Paul, to the end of his life, right before he was killed at the age of 60 something, or I, I, don't, I don't even know his age, it was 80, 64-ish or so. But it says that he was living in his own house and he was teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ and preaching the kingdom of God. So what was Paul preaching to the end of his days? Not the gospel of salvation. That's important. Let's get people saved. Amen. But that's not the final destination. 
there's something so much greater than someone believing in Jesus and being saved. And there are major implications now, the next stage, and the eternal age. Are you picking up what I'm putting down? Now, this might be messing with you a little bit, but that's okay because the truth will set you free. Now, don't believe me. Go into the study. Let's believe the Bible. Let's not believe people. Let's not believe theologians unless, the, unless it affirms the Bible. <laughs> Unless that's what the Bible says. Because sometimes we can come up with stuff and, uh, and we can be in error. Look at Romans 4, 5. But to the one who does not work, Romans 4, 5, does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. So not work, but faith, that equals righteousness. And righteousness is always equated to salvation, the gift of eternal life. Okay, so let's talk about faith and works, because you're like, okay, Vic, I get this, but there's like a really popular passage. It's like James 2, 24, if you've read it before. It says that, you know, faith is not enough. You actually have to have works. Otherwise, you're not saved. You're not justified. Do you remember that one, Vic? Yes, I do. <laughs> Let's talk about it, because James is not contradicting Jesus and Paul. He's actually affirming it. James has a completely different context for what he's even talking about in his first, in his book, but he mentions this idea of justification and he's, he's identifying two different types of faith. He's identifying fake faith and genuine faith. Yeah. So let's take a look at this. And uh, we're gonna go to this passage, faith without works is dead. You know, so aren't works still required for salvation? Isn't that what James is preaching? Not no. even close. No. If you look at the context now, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time in this because there's so much more plowing to do. But um, no, works are not required for salvation. Works are a demonstration that your faith is genuine. So when you have genuine faith, it will start to produce fruit in your life. It will start to have, faith will look like something. Um, and it'll start to manifest in your life. But for it to start to manifest, you now have to cultivate that garden. Because God gives you the salvation in a seed form. Whether it sees fruit is whether you are cultivating, staying in the ground, staying dead, and allowing the Lord to work stuff in you. Because how many know there's some people, they become Christians, but the seed never produces fruit. And that's the warning for those that will never enter the kingdom of God. And they're not disciples of his because they don't steward it. God gives you the seed. You have to cultivate the fruit. Now, to cultivate the fruit, there's a lot of different things like remaining in him and abiding in him, you know, all that kind of stuff. But we actually have to partner with him because God doesn't want to do everything for you. A mature son, he wants to do it with you, not for you. When you're a baby, he'll do it for you. That's the new birth. You're a baby. He does the salvation for you. But the growth is up to you to partner with him. We actually have to yield. So there's, there's the work of justification, fully, fully Jesus. But then there's the work of sanctification, which is a partnership. It's up to you yielding. So how many know believers that they genuinely are saved, they love God, they pray, they talk to God, but they, 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 maybe they've experienced a lot of trauma or pain or addiction and they don't know how to get free from it. But every time they're in the presence of God or a service, they're always running forward to get help, but, they, oh, but they're still stuck. They genuinely, I mean, they're coming to God, they're praying, they wanna be free. You can tell, like you look at them like, man, this person's life has been changed. I know they're born again. Like they have new desires. They hate their sin, but they're still stuck in them. Yeah. Anyone ever met someone like that? Yeah. Anyone, that's who you are? You've still been stuck in cycles of sin? Let me ask you a question. Can you be a genuine believer and then still struggle with sin? Yeah. Yes. Can you be a genuine believer and still have an addiction? Yeah. I, bet, I would wager to say that there's a good percentage of people in this room that are addicted to stuff that's not healthy. They might be addicted to like non-Christian stuff, like really bad stuff, you know, like, you know, abusing drugs or alcohol or whatever else, or, you know, abusing their words and cussing, whatever else. You know, we're talking about things like, oh man, that's bad. Like avoid that. That's like oh, more than PG, you know? And then there's like the Christian versions of addiction, like, you know, where you cope by eating too much ice cream or over-serving or overworking or masking stuff. Then there's like Christianly accepted addictions. But nonetheless, there's brokenness that's being hidden behind the addiction. Now, would you say that like, oh man, if there's any addiction in your life, you're definitely not saved. You're going to hell, eternal destruction for you. No, anyone that understands the gospel of Jesus Christ, the grace and mercy of God knows that actually it's your faith that saves you. God wants you to be free from addiction. Are you willing to lay down and partner? Now, there's some people that struggle their whole life and they end up dying in that addiction. 
now, are they going to hell? Now, uh, I was taught and grew up thinking that yes, like, because, you know, we thought it was all about works. So they're like, hey, one unconfessed sin is one unforgiven sin, which means you ain't going to heaven. No eternal life for you. So then we made salvation about works. Like you have to have everything confessed, everything repentant, everything this. And it's like, actually, salvation no longer is a gift of God. It's up to you doing all this work to maintain your salvation. And so that message made a lot of people very insecure about their salvation. And now they're coming to church, not because they love God, because they just want a ticket to heaven. They're like, I'll do whatever it takes. Like I'll pay whatever price. Like I just don't wanna go to the hot place. And then all of a sudden we switched people's motivations from love to avoid (laughs) self-preservation. The wrong message will teach people self-preservation instead of self-surrender to him. So when we believe the gospel, it sets us free. And I'm not, I, when I have genuine faith and I've been born again, I've been born from above, my desires change. I'm a new creation. Like something happened, but that doesn't mean that all my problems and maybe pain and subconscious trauma that I've gone through went away. That's gonna take me a process of healing and opening up. Now, now there's different categories of people. There's those that have never been born again, but they kind of grew up in a religious environment and they think they're born again. But there's no evidence that they've been born again. Like, they're not surrendering to God. They basically, here's, that that group of people is asking this question. Um, So tell me where the line is that I, so I don't cross it, so I don't go to hell. So they're always like, well, show me in the Bible where, you know, adultery is wrong. Show me the Bible where sex before marriage is wrong. So usually those people that are like, I don't think that's sin. I really want to do that. Give me biblical permission to do that. They don't have a new nature. So those people, they grew up religious. They've never been born again. And so their inner desire is always towards sin. Their inner bent is towards sin. Now they might be religious. They might have grown up in church. They might try to have theological conversations with you, but it's unto giving them freedom to do what's inside of them. So there's a category of people that they might be religious, but they've never been born again. They they, They can preach it, they can teach it. They're not born again. How do you know? When you give them freedom called grace, they'll go into sin because it's like, oh wait, you're saying that I have eternal life and I can do whatever I want and what I want is sin? Ooh, you just identified you've never been born again. When what you want, when you're set free is sin, there's no new nature there. But when you're fully set free and what you want is righteousness, that's the evidence of being born again. So essentially, let me tell you about four categories of people. There's the unbeliever that knows they're the unbeliever and they don't really care. They're not religious. They don't care about religion. Then there's the unbeliever. They have never been born again, but they think that they're born again. They go to church they struggle with sin, they do the thing, they argue scripture verses about what's sin and not because they wanna always get away with what their inner bent is, sin. There's that category of people. Now them, we need to tell them, yo, listen, you never been born again because you love sin. We need to actually set them free with truth. Then there's the category of people that are genuinely born again, but they're still stuck with their struggle because they haven't renewed their mind and the truth hasn't set them free. They haven't surrendered. They've, they're either stuck because they haven't got the help. They, they don't ask for the help. They don't know what the help they need is. They're, they've been born again. You know their inner side has changed. They wanna do what's right, but they're still struggling. There's that category of person. That's the one that Jesus is like, listen, be careful because you ain't coming into the kingdom of God. Now you have eternal life. You just not coming into the kingdom of God. Then there's the the fourth category of people. They're born again and they live their life surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus and the kingdom of God belongs to such as these and they're disciples of Jesus and they're going on the honeymoon and they're gonna live in the new Jerusalem and their life is one with God. They're stewarding their oil and intimacy with him. That's the fourth category of different types of people that you will encounter in life to kind of make it really simple. Okay, just to kind of paint the broad as we kind of dive into the nitty gritty. Are you doing okay? Yes. Man, we're like not even a third of the way in. We got to rush, okay? So if you're rushing here, you're gonna help me because you know how to rush, praise God. Okay, so uh, let's look at James two seventeen. James two seventeen says this. So also faith by itself if it does not have works, is dead. So we know this. Faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Now, what is James talking about? He's defining two different types of faith. He's not preaching a works gospel. I'll show you this in a minute. Look at, we're gonna skip down to verse 24 to save time. James 2, 24. You see that a person is justified by works 
and not by faith alone. Well, Vic, case in point, you know, everything you just preached up to this point is wrong because look at that verse. A person's not justified, is justified by works and not faith alone. Hmm. And this is where people will take one verse out of context, say what the Bible is not saying, and then preach a works message and completely deny 150 scriptures by Jesus himself and Paul because they don't understand this one passage. Now, let me explain to you what type of faith is being addressed here. Let's look at verse 14. James 2, we're still in James 2. We're popping around in this passage of scripture just to save time. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that kind of faith save him? The, so now we're talking about the person that's in category two. They claim that they have faith, but claiming faith is that kind of faith can't save you. And then Paul descri- I mean, James describes the type of faith this is. It's actually the same faith that's in verse 19. You believe God is one, that's awesome. So do the demons. <laughs> and they're even scared. <laughs> That faith can't save you because that's the demon faith. Demons believe that Jesus is Lord, that he died on the cross, that that, that that he raised from the dead. They literally know all the points of the gospel and they can quote scripture perfectly. We see it all over the Bible. Like, you know, the devil comes to Jesus and he's quoting scripture perfectly. So knowing about the gospel and quoting it, that's demon faith. (laughs) But it's not faith that'll save you. The faith that'll save you is actually when your faith is genuine and you're born again and you have a new nature. And all of a sudden that looks like something. Yeah, you might still be stuck in your struggle, but you definitely have a new nature and you don't wanna be stuck in your struggle. Your whole life is a struggle against the stuff that you're going through rather than trying to find theological excuses to do what you wanna do. Praise God. So James is dealing with two particular kinds of faith. Go to that next slide. James distinguishes between genuine faith, which he calls alive faith or the faith of God versus you say you have faith, but it's dead faith or demon faith. Those are the words used in that passage. Like you say you have faith, you claim it, but your faith is dead and that's the faith demons have. But then there's the genuine faith, alive faith, the faith of God. So James is just distinguishing between category number two, claiming faith, category number three, you actually are saved. James is distinguishing between category number two and three of a Christian. Does that make sense? Okay, that's real quick. Now, let's take a look real quick. We're gonna dive into this list and we're gonna have to wrap this up. We're gonna have to get some more teaching. Praise God. Requirements for being a disciple. Now, I put this into categories. I looked at every single verse that looked like there was a requirement there, and I just categorized it into categories that, to me, could like I could clump them together and make a list. This is my list, and there's a bunch of scriptures. Now, um, I gave you a few scriptures under each one, but to be a disciple, a requirement was to follow Jesus. Now, you don't have that requirement to be saved. Nowhere out of the 150 does it say following equals saved. No, but to be a disciple you better follow. Unless you follow me, you're not my disciple. So Jesus makes a distinction between believing in eternal life and following and being a disciple. Another one, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow him daily, right? There, in Luke, the Luke passage says daily. The Matthew passage says, deny yourself and take up your cross. That's required to be a disciple, denying yourself. I know a lot of Christians that don't deny themselves. They give themselves whatever they want, whenever they want, however they want. Now, I'm not gonna preach to them a law message that you probably don't have eternal life, you're damned to hell, you know? Like, I'm not gonna preach that message to them because that's not the message the Bible preaches to them. So why would I preach a message that's not biblical? I will preach a message to them that like, yo, there's some serious consequences to you not denying yourself. Like number, and, and like, uh, let's just distinguish if you even are category two, you think you're saved, but you're not really saved. Let's, let's find out what's really in you, you know? Number three, hate, hating your family and even your own life. That's a requirement. Wow, what do you mean, hating your family? I thought God was the God of love. Doesn't Jesus like love everybody? Hating your family? That doesn't sound godly. 
What's he saying? He said, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. Because when family is in darkness and then light comes to part of the family and that person gets saved, light and darkness can't coexist anymore. So he says, I didn't come to bring you peace, but a sword because the revelation and the message of Jesus is gonna bring light to a family. And if the whole family doesn't accept it, it's gonna be cause a division between light and darkness within that family, right? So it wasn't about, we think love everybody is like, you know, be at peace with darkness. No, 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 we don't have to be at peace with darkness. There's a separation between light and darkness. Now, we need, to, we need to manifest and show the love of God to people so they can come into the light. But light and darkness have nothing in common. Hating your own family. Giving up all your possessions. Unless you give up all your possessions, you cannot be my disciple. I'm just quoting the words of Jesus. Now, notice this, this is like all gospel language. This is what Jesus said, you know? Let's just take a look at him a little closer. Uh, Luke 9, 23, that's one of the verses. It says, He was saying to them all, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. See, there it is. Uh, Let's take a look at Luke 14. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life cannot be my disciple. Now, some people will take this and preach that this is what's required for salvation. And they'll make salvation this impossible destination for people. But that's not what Jesus was preaching about salvation. Look at the book of John, 86 times in the book of John, he says, just believe. But to be a disciple, you gotta lay down your life. Whoever doesn't carry his own cross and come after me can't be my disciple. So there's a hating and a carrying your cross. Now, that's a whole other message, but your cross is basically the place of death. It's your altar. The cross was where things died. So take up your altar because you never know when, when your master is gonna ask you to surrender something else. Because a disciple lives a surrendered life. So always carry your altar because you never know when he's gonna ask you to put something on the altar. A disciple is always ready to surrender what he's asking. Wait, God, you gave me that job, but yeah, but now I'm asking for it back. And a disciple will just surrender it on the cross. So take up your cross it's not like, you know, I die daily. I mean, that, that's not what Paul meant there. He's saying, I face death daily, meaning people are trying to kill me every day. No, he's saying, my cross is with me all the time because when he asks for surrender, I say yes. Okay, so none of you can be my disciples who do not give, give up all their own possessions. Look at verse 33. None of you can be my disciples. You don't give up all your possessions. So is giving up all your possessions required to be saved? Nowhere do we see that in the Bible. For discipleship, you better believe it everything. He's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. He's just Savior. Praise God. Lord of all. Okay, look at number five, requirements for being a disciple. Love God and love one another. If you don't love your neighbor, how can you say that you love God, right? So there's this loving God and loving neighbor, many different scriptures on it. I'll let you look them up. Obeying Jesus's teachings. We looked at that in John 8, 31. Producing fruit. If you produce fruit and prove you're my disciples, endure suffering and persecution. So there's the the final list. So I put them into eight things, eight requirements with the scriptures. Go check it out and do the study on this. Let's just take a look at a couple of them real quick. John 13, 35. By this, all men will know you're my disciples if you have love, if you have love. Salvation is not if you. Salvation is I give you a gift, only believe. Discipleship is if you. That's a work, that's a requirement. They'll know you're my disciples if you have love. So love is required to be a disciple. John 8, 31, to the Jews who believed, he said, if you hold to my teaching, you're truly my disciples. There's an if there. John 15, 8, my father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove that you're my disciples. So bearing fruit is necessary to prove you're a disciple. Let's take a look at this comparison list real quick. Eternal life versus being a disciple. Throw that up there, the next one. <clears throat> Eternal life is a free gift, always in the Bible, 150 verses. Discipleship will cost you everything. Your family, your life, your possessions. Eternal life, just received by faith. Discipleship, it's received by surrender and obedience. <laughs> Eternal life, never by works. Discipleship, works. <laughs> Eternal life, you're instantly justified, made righteous. Discipleship is lifelong surrender and sanctification. Eternal life, Jesus paid the price for that. Discipleship, you pay the price. 
I'm gonna invite you into paying the price, not for your salvation, but to be a disciple. Eternal life, believe in Jesus. To be a disciple, follow Jesus. Eternal life, believe in Jesus. Discipleship, obey Jesus. Eternal life can never be earned. Discipleship, you earn rewards. Okay, just kind of a quick comparison. The Bible is clear these are different things. So when we preach them all together and mash them up, we kind of confuse people and make them really insecure about their salvation. No, I'm not about saying that everyone's saved just because they think that Jesus is Lord. No, no, Jesus said like, there's people that claim faith, but they've never been born again. So I'm not saying like cheap, easy, whatever. I'm saying like, you still, I mean, there's a believing faith that looks like transformation in your life, but then you got to steward that transformation. Is Jesus the Lord of your life or only the Savior? Because lordship is about surrender. It's about the cross. Luke 6, don't call me Lord, Lord. (laughs) Do what he says. Don't call me Lord, Lord. Do what he says. And that's so similar to other passages that talk about the kingdom of God. We'll take a look at this real quickly. Oh man, help us, Lord. You know, like they prayed and like they got extra 20 minutes or something. Lord, if I pray, can I get 20 minutes extra? I don't know. (laughs) Okay, lordship is the way into the kingdom of God, not salvation. Lordship is the way into the kingdom of God, not salvation. Salvation, you get the free gift of God, eternal life. Lordship is the way into the kingdom. So being a disciple and, and entering the kingdom, these are synonymous. And when you look at the lists, a lot of them are like identical as far as the requirements go. But take a look at this verse, famous passage. I used to not understand it. And I used to preach basically a kind of a, a message that like, man, like most people will not get saved like on the earth. There's very few that'll find the road. And then when I realized like, wow, all of those comments Jesus made are referring to the kingdom, not referring to salvation. So take a look at Matthew 7, just as, as kind of an example of this. Matthew 7, 21 and 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom. Notice the language here. Now we're not dealing with salvation anymore because Jesus makes that clear. He's dealing with entering the kingdom because we sometimes make these passages about salvation or not. So now when you go through reading your Bible, make a distinction between are we dealing with salvation here or are we dealing with discipleship and entering the kingdom? It'll change your whole reading of the New Testament. I'm telling you. But the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven will enter. So sometimes we think the kingdom of heaven means, means eternal life in heaven. No, no, no. Kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. I'll explain that in just a minute. But it's basically, the, it's the realm where Jesus is king and reigns. Wherever Jesus is Lord, that's where the kingdom is. He says that, he said this, the kingdom of God is within you. How can it be within you? If Jesus is Lord, it's within you. If Jesus is not Lord, there's no kingdom within you. So, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord. Now, these are people, some people will paint this as like, these are non-believers. They're gonna say, Lord, Lord. Unbelievers aren't gonna be saying, Jesus, Lord, Lord. I prophesied in your name. I didn't just prophesy. I prophesied in the name of Jesus. I cast out demons in the name of Jesus. I performed miracles in the name of Jesus. They use in the name three times. This is, we're dealing with someone that's a believer. Lord, Lord, twice. We're dealing with someone that's a believer here. I will declare to them. Now, he says, many will say, I will declare to them, I didn't know you because you practice wickedness. You might have eternal life, but your life wasn't transformed. Like you simultaneously practice sin and try to, you know, do powerful, mighty acts as a believer. No entrance to the kingdom. What are we dealing with? We're dealing with the first resurrection when Jesus returns and the dead in Christ will rise and they're gonna be ruling and reigning with Jesus on the earth for a thousand years. That's the entry we're talking about here. I'll declare to them, you've been practicing lawlessness, no first resurrection for you. We're gonna wait till judgment day after the thousand year reign, second resurrection. You're gonna face the gray white throne judgment. We're gonna deal with you practicing lawlessness. So sin will destroy your entrance into the kingdom of God. Sin is a serious deal for a believer. It's the difference between you have eternal life versus you're not, not gonna see the kingdom of God. Man, that's a big deal. That's sobering. So we're, we're not telling people that, like, you know, so I used to think this was saved and unsaved until I finally understood the message of the kingdom of God. 
So what is the kingdom of God? Real quickly up here, the kingdom of God is the rule of God through Jesus Christ. So wherever Jesus is ruling and reigning, that's where the kingdom of God is. Jesus said, look, the kingdom of God is at hand, meaning it's right around, like it's coming. The death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ initiated the kingdom of God on the earth. But it's again, it's a seed that's growing. But now we're waiting for the full manifestation of the kingdom at his return. And then we're gonna have a whole new age where the new Jerusalem, heaven and earth come together. And it's like the garden of Eden restored. That's the final age. That's after that. Anyways, we won't get into the whole map of eschatology and all that kind of stuff yet. Maybe we'll do that later. But take a look at the, I put 11 requirements of entering the kingdom of God. I looked at every time it says, there, you know, throughout scripture, there's dozens of scriptures about entering the kingdom of God. But the, one of the first ones is being born again and saved. He tells it to Nicodemus, unless you're born again, you can't enter the kingdom. So first requirements, you have to be born again and saved. No one unsaved will enter the kingdom of God, but you can just be saved and not enter. But to enter, you have to be saved. <laughs> so step one is be saved. Then we looked at Matthew seven, you must do the will of God. Not just say, Lord, Lord, and do miracles and prophesying and healing and whatever else. You must do the will of God. You must not practice lawlessness, right? Uh, you must be a disciple and follower of Jesus, according to Luke 9. You must live righteously and free from sin. Now, this is a long list of passages. Not all of them are listed there. But every time where it says, like, no one who does this or this or this or this or this will ever enter the kingdom of God. I used to think that that meant heaven, eternal life. The Bible makes a distinction between heaven and the kingdom of God. Now, look at my study on that. There's a difference between heaven. Heaven is a place. The kingdom of God is the realm wherever Jesus reigns. Okay? So anyone who practices this or this or this or this will never enter the kingdom of God. Verse five, I mean, number five, be like a child. Unless you humble yourself like a child, you'll never enter the kingdom of God. There's several verses on that. Look at number six, the narrow way. That's again, talking about the kingdom of God. We, we made that about salvation or not saved. Like very few people will be saved. I don't think very few people will be saved. I mean, the gospel has been being preached all over the world. I mean, there's a lot of believers in Jesus, but I don't know if there's a lot of disciples of Jesus. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. He didn't say just go and make believers. Come on, that's too cheap. He wants more. He wants the bride. He wants the chambers. He wants the honeymoon with you. Don't just give someone the gospel of salvation. Make them a disciple. Make them a disciple. Through hardship and persecution, we will enter the kingdom of God. It's through many hardships that we enter the kingdom of God. We must produce fruit to enter the kingdom of God. We must be poor in spirit to enter the kingdom of God. We must love God and love people to enter the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God won't be, uh, won't be inherited by our physical bodies. We're gonna have a new body for the kingdom of God. That's that glorified body. That's that first resurrection where we'll be transformed and we'll rule and reign with him for a thousand years. So why is it so important to enter the kingdom of God? So I, I listed some of these things, but we're gonna end with this. So put the first one up there. Why should we enter the kingdom of God? Because otherwise you won't be part of first resurrection, which is the honeymoon. It's the marriage feast. It's the millennial reign at the return of Jesus. So some, I used to think that all believers would be resurrected at the first resurrection. That's not what the Bible teaches. It actually says this is only for the five wise virgins, not the five foolish ones. Because the difference between wisdom and foolishness is what you did with your life. The difference between your saved and not saved is what you believed in what he did. The difference between foolish and wise is what you did. Take a look at the parable there what the kingdom of heaven will be like. Notice the kingdom is like this, 10 virgins. Now, all of them are virgins. They're, they're not five prostitutes and five virgins. They're all virgins. They all have lamps and they're all wanting the bridegroom. They dedicated their whole life to be a virgin pure and they want the bridegroom. But five were foolish with how they were building. Remember Jesus talked about in Matthew about like building like a foolish man or building like the wise man. And he's saying that there's some that are built foolishly and the door will be closed to them, to something. Not eternal life, but the door will be closed into the kingdom. So when they, when they took their lamps, there was no oil. Oil speaks of intimacy. They didn't maintain an intimacy in a relationship because when you're intimate, you're gonna obey. If you love him, you'll obey him. Sometimes if you're not obeying him, it's because you don't love him. It doesn't mean you lost your salvation. It just means he's not Lord. Because when you love him, you'll surrender to him. There's no oil there. 
The wise took flasks of oil. The bridegroom was delayed. They all became drowsy and slept. Now in the Bible, whenever Jesus refers to death, what word does he use? Sleep. What does Paul use when he refers to death? Sleep. So they all died because the bridegroom was delayed, which is what's been happening for 2,000 years. The bridegroom's delayed. A lot of people have died. Now guess what's gonna happen when the bridegroom returns? At midnight, there was a cry. This is the return of Jesus. Here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all the virgins rose, trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, we can't do that. There's not going to be enough for us. Go rather to the dealers. Get your own oil. And it says, when the bridegroom came, those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast. That's the honeymoon for a thousand years. Only the wise came into the the marriage feast and the door was shut. And afterwards, the other virgins came saying, Lord, Lord, these are believers. Lord, Lord, open to us as well. But he said, I don't know you. That word no is not the word, I don't know about you. God knows about everyone. He created everyone. He said, I don't have intimacy with you. There's no oil. It's the word gnosko. It's the word intimate knowing like a marriage, like we don't have this. You haven't yielded to me. You built foolishly. So the door was closed to the kingdom and they had to wait for the second resurrection. Okay, why is this so important? Number two, living in the new Jerusalem, the city of God with Jesus. And then number three, receiving rewards, crowns, and glory. The new Jerusalem and rewards, crowns, and glory are for those in the kingdom. And there's gonna be different rankings in the kingdom of God, the the thousand year reign, and also in eternity. We won't go into all the verses that show this, but this is gonna be my next couple studies, but uh, we end here. A lot of teaching here, I know. We almost went for, I don't know, 50 minutes or something (laughs) or more. But I wanted you to get a picture that how you steward your life matters. Is Jesus your savior? Is he your Lord? How you steward your life and how you build matters. So I'm calling you, if you're in category one and you know you've never had a relationship with Jesus, you don't pretend like you're saved, you don't pretend to be religious, I'm gonna invite you into making Jesus your savior and Lord. I wanna invite you into the marriage feast of the lamb. I wanna invite you into the honeymoon. I wanna invite you into eternal rewards and glory and crowns and righteousness. Not because we want them, but because we wanna offer him something because he offered us everything. It's not selfishness. I'm gonna... I'm gonna work with the Lord, not because I need something, but because I love him and he gave his life for me. And I want to be as close as possible with him. I wanna be part of the honeymoon. I don't wanna just be outside of the city coming in and out. I wanna be in the new Jerusalem with him. I want the Lord. So I'm not gonna work for him. I'm gonna work with him, not to earn salvation, but to be with him. It's about proximity. So if you're in the first category, you've never made Jesus your Lord, I wanna invite you, would you surrender and make Jesus? Would you believe in him? Not the demon faith, but the saving faith where you're born again and everything is new. I wanna invite you today. If that's you, would you just raise your hand and say, that's me, like, I've never made Jesus my savior or Lord. Like, I wanna believe in him. I wanna make him Lord. That's you, just be bold enough. I mean, this is family. There's no shame. We've all done this step. We just wanna welcome you to do that. If that's you, I'm not gonna have you stand up or respond. Just wave at me and that's it, okay? If you're in the second category and you think that you're saved because you know scriptures and you were raised in the faith, but like inside, if you were given freedom, you always want sin. Like you're like, you're not, you're not struggling with sin. You like, you go after it. You pursue it. You're looking for like justification. Like, I think I'm good. I mean, I prayed the prayer. Like, I'm good, right? I'm good with the fire thing. Cool. Like I prayed the prayer. Like, oh, sweet. I can finally like do whatever I want to do. Man, you've never been born again and you're deceived. You think you're born again. Like be born again. Have a new nature put in you where everything will change from the inside out. Start a real relationship with Jesus. Get born again. And then primarily this message was for those in category three. You are a genuine believer, but man, you're not surrendered to the Lord. Your life's about your comfort. It's about you. You haven't given up your possessions or really anything, you know, a little bit here and there. You're still stuck in lawlessness and sin. You're still dealing with gossip. You're still, I mean, it says like, I mean, look at the list of things. Thieves, gossip, slanders will have no inheritance in the kingdom of God. 
I mean, sometimes we think it's only the high level sins like in that list, like homosexuals or, you know, the adulterers. We're like, oh yeah, definitely not kingdom. Uh, Gossip too. So I'm calling you to repent for the kingdom of God matters. Repent, believer. Repent, believer. And be, and be transformed. Amen? Jesus, we thank you. Help us, Lord. Thank you that truth sets us free. Lord, we take this message and let it not be condemnation, but let it be motivation. Let truth set us free, Lord. Lord, you didn't come to condemn, but you came to set us free. So I thank you that the love of God, the goodness of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God would draw us, God, that we'd be arrested by your love, God. That we'd be so loved by you that we would love you back. We can't do anything but love. Jesus, I pray for a revelation of the love of God, which changes us, which causes us to lay down our life. Not because we have to, but because we want to, Lord. So I wanna just invite you to stand up, let's worship. If you need to respond, you're what, maybe category one, category two, category three, you need to respond to God. I'm gonna invite you to respond. We're gonna open up the altars. We're gonna worship for another few moments. If you need to be dismissed and pick up your kids, go for it, come back in if you want. If you need to leave, be dismissed. But let's just linger. Let's just linger. I believe that there's a response that the Lord wants to invite you into. I want you to ask, Holy Spirit, what are you telling me from today's message? What are you asking me to do? Because if he's Lord, he'll ask you something and you'll respond. Lord, what are you asking me to do? How are you asking me to respond, Lord? Not just Savior, but Lord. How are you asking me to respond? today. I surrender all. I surrender all. I invite you to be Lord. I take up my cross, that place of sacrifice, and I say, I follow you. I lay down my life for you. I'll give everything for you. It's not a sacrifice. It's a joy. It's a joy. Jesus, we love you. 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 We worship you. We offer our bodies. We offer our souls, we offer our homes. We give you room in our homes. We give you room in our life. We give you room in our schedules. We give you room, God. We give you the room. We don't just give you a room in the house. We give you all the rooms in the house. We give you everything in the house, God. We surrender our sin to you. Take it, God. We surrender our addiction to you. We surrender our sickness to you. We're followers of Jesus. We break off sin and addiction and shame. We break off those things that have held you back and out of the kingdom of God. We break off those things in Jesus' name. The power of the gospel sets you free. So be free today. Be free today. Be free from addiction. Be free from shame. Be free from guilt. Be free. The gospel is the power of God to save you. Thank you for joining King Movement Online. I pray and hope that that sermon impacted you deeply. I would love if you shared this with a few friends and family. And before you go, don't forget to subscribe. See you next week.